history teaches us one thing. Change is inevitable. This most ancient truth has been illustrated time and time again as every great empire, no matter how powerful, eventually falls. In every instance, wise men have predicted their empire's end, but their dire warnings went unheeded. Is it possible that in modern times this may be happening close to home? Could America be headed for catastrophe? There are men among us today who believe a collapse is not only possible, but that it has already begun. Unlike Nostradamus or other bygone prophets, they look not to crystal balls or the stars, but to actual evidence to reinforce their claims. Their visions are of financial instability, oil and water depletion, hostile technology, and terrorist aggression. These men are gathering now to share their visions of the dangers that threaten the American way of life. They look to the lessons of empires past for clues to how we may avoid their fate, for ways we can prevent history from repeating itself so that America does not descend into oblivion like every great empire that has come before. Michael Craig Rupert has long foreseen the impending threats to America. Born in 1951 in Washington, D.C., his family had ties to the CIA, U.S. Air Force, and Army. As a detective for the Los Angeles Police Department, he uncovered a CIA drug trafficking operation in 1977. This led him to found an organization dedicated to exposing government corruption, a political renegade. He has never been afraid to speak his mind, and Rupert is now certain. Our society is disintegrating from within. We cannot, as a nation, as a planet, or as a species, continue to live the way we have under the assumptions that we have, because if we do, we are committing suicide. This isn't about environmentalism anymore. This is not a lefty, feel-good, fuzzy, warm, save the whale issue. This is a matter of survival. By this time next year, I'm certain that we won't recognize the United States of America. Rupert believes that our explosive population growth over the past two centuries is the result of one thing, fossil fuel. One of the first applications was to create an internal combustion-powered tractor for the purpose of plowing, because you could multiply the number of acres that could be plowed. And then it was discovered that you could make fertilizers out of ammonia, which is produced from natural gas. So it became possible to feed many more people as oil and natural gas began to be used more and more. It is solely the fact of hydrocarbon energy, specifically internal combustion-powered engines, ammonium-based fertilizers made from natural gas, and pesticides made from petroleum that has allowed the human population to expand in just a little over 120, 130 years. In the starkest terms, human population was fairly stable at just under one and a half, two billion people from the time of Christ until oil was discovered. There was a slight dip for the bubonic plague, a slight increase as the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution came along with steam and with coal. But it was not until the discovery and use of oil that human population skyrocketed from a simple arithmetic standpoint. If you just look at the numbers, essentially five billion too many people are living on this planet today that are not sustainable by any other means. As human civilization undergoes this enormous, painful transition, everything that mankind has held sacred is on the table. It's a matter of life and death now. The United States population more than tripled in the 20th century. It is projected to increase yet another 46% by the end of the year 2050. With fossil fuels running out, Rupert does not see how our infrastructure will keep pace. You know, I think food exemplifies our problem as much as anything else. 
We have boxed ourselves into a situation where we transport food over enormous distances, where we fail to return nutrients to the topsoil so that it will grow anything else without those chemicals. And if those chemicals that come from oil and natural gas go away, the food goes away. And if the food goes away, people starve. And that process is beginning all over the world now. Our population is still growing, even as the resources needed to keep that population fed are going away. Our population should be diminishing also, but we're in a condition of overshoot. We're still expanding. There aren't enough resources on a finite planet, a closed sphere, to sustain infinite growth. We just can't do it. Rupert believes the America of the future will bear little resemblance to the nation we know now. The indicators that the United States of America is collapsing are all around us. The changes now are going to come much more rapidly. They're going to be much harder to take. And the choices that we make now are going to determine how we're able to deal with those challenges. It's a question about our ability to eat, to stay warm, to move, to interact, to live any kind of a life that bears any resemblance to anything like the life that we've lived before or that has any kind of quality in it. It means that the way of life that the world has come to know since the discovery of oil about 130, 140 years ago is all coming to an end. We are going to see things like government cities and towns going bankrupt, which is happening. School districts are cutting back to four day weeks. Everywhere, major cities are doing police cutbacks and fire cutbacks. We're seeing major infrastructure failures. An explosion in San Bruno, California of a natural gas pipeline that was laid in 1948 and nobody had the money to repair the infrastructure. We're going to see major failures and calamities and disasters like that. The bridge failure in Minnesota a few years ago, not to mention 30 million unemployed, collapsing home values all over the place, foreclosures soaring. We are seeing all the signs of collapse throughout this country, and they're becoming more obvious every day. Rupert is certain these troubles aren't temporary nor are they the ordinary products of an economic downturn. He is convinced they are symptoms of a coming collapse. Collapse has happened to every empire in human history. That seems to be, if you will, a natural law, that empires can grow to a certain place, and then they implode. 2,000 years ago, the Roman Empire was the most powerful on Earth. The similarities between Rome then and America today are striking. And the story of what ultimately befell that nation is told in museums around the world. Like here in America today, Rome's armies were spread too thin in too many foreign countries. Barbarian invasions like terrorist attacks and cross-border incursions as we see in Mexico's drug wars were constant. The government was corrupt and the only way to get anything accomplished was through bribery or by increasing taxes. This is no different than the stranglehold lobbyists, banks, and corporations have on our government today. America, like ancient Rome, has this blind faith that we are superior to the rest of the world and it's our destiny to reign supreme forever. It's not gonna happen. We are going to learn some hard lessons and adjust to some hard circumstances, but we do have choices. The American empire is going to fall, but we do not all have to fall with it. America dominates the world today on a scale far greater than even Rome could have imagined. But history as well as nature prove that size itself is no guarantee of continued survival. And what's in front of us now is the same thing that was in front of the dinosaurs, evolve or perish. Grow up or die. Change the way you think and the way you operate because the universe will, without remorse, coldly it might seem, but with the beauty that is natural law, will let us go extinct.
The question of survival is very much like the Titanic. A huge ship that was believed to be unsinkable, that could go forever. On its maiden voyage, it sank, but there weren't enough lifeboats on that ship to save all the lives on board. At any point in that voyage, and especially after the iceberg hit, had there been an organized effort to scavenge from the Titanic enough material to make lifeboats, many, many hundreds of lives more might have been saved. Titanic, of course, is a great word. It implies and encompasses the size and the complexity of human industrial civilization. The Titanic is going to sink, and there are some people that will not believe it until they're underwater. Michael Rupert isn't the only one with dark visions of the future. Others also anticipate the fall of America. Each believes the cause will be different, but the outcome hauntingly similar. They meet to share their insights to try to gain a broad perspective on the challenges we must confront, and to decide which threat is of most immediate concern. The most important priorities that, that we have are saving lives. If I had to sum all the problems down to one word, it is overpopulation. Because there are five billion people on the planet today who did not exist at the dawn of the oil age. And they exist only because of oil and natural gas. You know, it sounds like you're talking about the great die-off, like, uh, like the Permian-Triassic, you know, the great, ex the mother of all mass. There's a mass extinction, extinction underway right now. We're going through, they called it the great die-off. I'll interject a, a few thoughts on that. I am not um, predicting any die-off. The near-term hurdle is we have to deal with our excessive errors we've made in our financial system. We've lived beyond our means, and we've extended that living beyond our means by issuing more credit, and there's going to be a reckoning there. The financial system, as we know it, is completely untenable and it, there are going to be big changes. Once the majority of those changes happen, history shows time and again that people inherently help each other out. The more people prepare, the less likely that a, an exogenous financial shock is going to be a disaster. Our economic system is actually a giant global Ponzi scheme. How that unravels is going to have big consequences for the average American. America today is the mightiest nation since the dawn of man. Yet history tells us empires rise only to inevitably fall. The circumstances change, but the results do not. Now, there are those who believe America's destiny will be no different. One of these men is Nathan Hagens, born 1965 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. With a PhD in natural resources, this former investment banker was managing a hedge fund when he came to the conclusion our current economic system was unsupportable. He resigned. Our economic system is actually a giant global Ponzi scheme. And the way that translates is a lot of this debt and credit that has been built may someday never be paid off. How that unravels is going to have big consequences for the average American. Capitalism is going to have to be retooled or it's going to completely go by the wayside. What we have now has been a failure. The future is going to look very different than the past in, in one primary regard in that the world economy will no longer continue to grow. Until 12,000 years ago, humans lived on a hunter-gatherer foraging lifestyle. And then we started to find and develop agricultural methods where we could grow things that we didn't need to eat that day, we could store them for many months or even a year. And then we started to live more sedentary lifestyles and develop technology, etc. And then in the 1700s, we basically hit the energy jackpot when we figured out how to use coal, and then subsequently in the 1800s, oil, and then uh, in the last century, natural gas. 
now the question is, what's going to replace fossil fuels? Every American right now has two to three hundred energy slaves standing behind them doing work that we take for granted. The energy in the taxi that got me here today, the lights in this building, our food system, the average food travels 1,500 miles to get to our plate, and that all uses energy. All these things are subsidized by a one-time endowment of fossil energy that is so powerful that for all human intents and purposes, it is indistinguishable from magic. Hagens believes the current global depression is the beginning of an economic collapse that will intensify as natural resources run out and alternative energies fail to replace them in time. Technology is in a race with depletion, and depletion is winning. People need to recognize, OK, we live on a finite planet, and we have virtually infinite wants and perceived needs. But those two trends are butting up against each other, and what are we going to do about it? We've been so endowed with natural resources for 60, 70, 80 years, we have not really thought that this was a problem. There have been some recessions and even a Great Depression, but we've always reset from that. We build our institutions and our expectations assuming that this sort of subsidy will continue in the future. And now we've built a lifestyle that is no longer sustainable. We can live within our means, but only when we acknowledge that there are limits. And our economic system right now does not acknowledge that there are limits. The financial system as we know it is completely untenable and it, there are going to be big changes. The idea that our economic system is completely failing is hard to believe. But Hagen's points to America's mountainous debt as proof. The balance between that debt and our available resources is delicate. When it tips, the system collapses. We have built an entire industrial civilization on the assumption that there will be more every year. We now know that resources are harder to find, and in order to keep the system going, we've flooded the American economy as well as the world economy with more and more credit. We've created a, a large debt overhang, and right now we're kind of in this wily e. Coyote moment where we've fallen off the cliff and the government is supporting the feeling that things are okay, but in reality, right around the corner, there's some very different trajectories. Basic needs, food procurement, water, just knowing that people are gonna get fed is gonna become more prominent in people's minds, just like it did in the Great Depression. The 1920s were this kind of go-go period where a lot of people were invested in the stock market. On Black Tuesday, the stock market lost 12% and it lost 40% two months later, and eventually the stock market from its highs in 1929 to its lows in the mid-30s lost 90% of its value. In the Great Depression, around 35 million people lived in families where no one had a job out of a population of 120 million. So during that decade, the average income of those people that worked declined 40%, so it was pretty desperate back then. The government is attempting the same things that it attempted in the 30s, by borrowing money and stimulating the economy. But the problem is we can't continue to inject money from thin air into a system and continue to think that it's gonna hold together. You cannot solve a credit crisis by adding more credit, period. The American economy rebounded from the Great Depression to become larger and more dynamic than ever before, reinforcing the theory of cyclical markets, in which booms are followed by busts, and then ultimately a bigger boom. Hagen's cautions, this belief is more faith than fact. I believe the United States is insolvent and that some of these debts that we've incurred from the past are gonna come home, and we're gonna have to face the reality. The moment of bankruptcy comes when people want the money, when they want the claims to be paid off. 
America, uh, unfortunately, is asleep with a lot of these issues. And part of this is due to cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is when our brains don't want to acknowledge the gravity or seriousness of the situation. And a good example is in Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, where he talked about a dam was about to break. And people three miles downstream were really afraid. And people two miles downstream were like really freaked out. But people living within a mile living of, of the dam, they weren't concerned at all. If things are too frightening and too threatening, our brains tune it out because it would affect our behavior and it would be too painful to accept. So peak oil and peak credit and the depletion of cheap fossil fuels and what that means for the end of growth, it's too overwhelming. The financial reckoning that's coming could include many different scenarios. It could be a, a no more U.S. currency and the U.S. currency is replaced by something else. It may happen that you have $100,000 in your bank and the next day you wake up and you have 10,000 Patriot dollars or something like that. It's happened many times. People remember Weimar Germany in the 1920s where there was the end of system of claims and end of a currency and there was something that would replace it. The average American knows that something is wrong, but the problem is, is they don't really speak up and get really vocal about it because they don't know what to do. Hagens feels this unprecedented financial crisis is the greatest threat to America today. The debate continues. The problems are all interrelated, the economy, energy, food and water. Okay, and how that works. Because we live in a world clearly where if you have the money, you can buy them. I put water at the top of the list, by the way, because everything everybody else has talked about, we have lived without once before. We've never lived without water, uh, which is one of the reasons it's taken for granted. Uh, we've never lived without it, and we're running out of it, and we don't see it. We live in a water economy. We do not live in a petroleum economy. Water runs the world. In five years at our current rate of behavior, we will have far more options for energy sources and far fewer options for water. But what's the big difference? There are replacements for oil. There are no replacements for water. People will look back uh, on the early 21st century and say, what were they thinking? We are not at the doorstep of a crisis. We are in a crisis. The story of every empire is one of rise and fall. Yet while the United States has seen its share of hard times, the expectation has always been one of boundless growth. History, however, promises one day we will take a long step back. Some men believe that day is today. Regardless of what our press releases are, it doesn't seem to me that we are making a better world to live in. My experience is the quality of life has been deteriorating rather than getting better. That sounds like that assumes we're, we're just at base uh, a, a cynical, selfish species. The human race has many redeeming qualities. The problem is which ones we choose to make paramount. The problem is which ones we choose to make our North Stars, if you will. I would still argue that the most pressing, predictable problem is a, an ongoing economic crisis. We've come across this huge abundance of resources, and we're burning through those. And it's only until we see the, the bottom of that barrel where we start to change uh, what we compete for and, and start to use technology as how do we get out of this mess. Sometime in the next decade, there's going to be a financial reckoning where we're going to have to dramatically tighten our belts, use less, consume less, because there will be less available. The United States right now uses twice the energy as the country of Ireland per individual. Yet on its subjective well-being studies, they're just as happy as we are. We use 37 times the energy as the average person in the Philippines, yet they are just as happy as we are. So I'm sure that whatever comes, we will be able to adapt to it. It's just the six-month window of when it happens that I worry about. 
One comment I'd like to make though is, is we're talking about what the most urgent problems are. Do we care about the next generation? Do we care about other species? Do we care about 300 years from now how many species or humans might inhabit the planet? Or do we just care about 2025? I mean, most people frankly care about this weekend. Yeah. Here's a subtle point. We evolved to not address a situation until it stared us in the face. There's something in economic called a discount rate, which is how much we value the present versus the future. A discount rate of one means we care only about this second. If you feed a goldfish, if you go out of town for four days and give it four days of food at once, it will eat until it explodes. Discount rate of zero is like a robot uh, where you would live for a million years and you care about today the exact same as you care about the year 21. 77. Humans have very steep discount rates and what this means is that we as a species won't really address our problems until the problems are staring us in the face. You know, peak oil and climate change and all these grand super themes that we read about, these are like 10, 20, 30 years down the road. That has the, the mental weight of zero to the average person hearing about it. If there's no toilet paper at the grocery store, today and you heard that there's not going to be any anywhere in the country, that's like, oh my God, stock up on toilet paper. So people uh, need an environmental cue showing them that scarcity or change is going to happen. Higgins believes people don't recognize change until it's staring them in the face. Hagen's also believes great changes could be upon us sooner than we realize. Eventually, the currencies we have right now might go away and might be replaced by something. It's not even my imagination. Our own Treasury Secretary last year mentioned a, a global currency. I am absolutely convinced that the imposition of a global currency will expedite the crash of everything much faster. You know, it's helpful to remember that paper currencies are only about 150 years old. This has been a very short-term experiment. Can, can I steer the, the, the conversation in a little bit more in a, in a sort of a practical direction for a second? Everything I'm listening to is fascinating, and half of it I agree with, half of it I disagree with. <laughs> uh, what about our practical problems of the future? Which is that we and the world are running out of water. John Cronin, born 1950, is the director of the Beacon Institute for Rivers and Estuaries and a senior fellow at Pace University. He has investigated environmental violations across the country and is developing a technology network to deliver real-time data on water quality. He sees a shortage of clean water as the most pressing threat to America. We don't live in a petroleum economy, we live in a water economy. When we lose it, we lose American life as we know it right now. Water is the substance upon which we depend. It is the foundation of life, it's the foundation of the planet. But all over the nation, and all over the world in fact, both uh, quantity and quality of water is in dire danger in the 21st century. In the Western United States, uh, the concept of water shortage, it's a headline uh, in daily newspapers. In 2010, Governor Schwarzenegger uh, told the state legislature in California that he would sign no more bills coming out of the state, state legislature until they revamped California's water laws. That's how severe it is. In the Midwest, uh, you have the Oglala Aquifer. There's this huge trapped underground sea of fresh water that was left behind by a glacier. You know, rainwater didn't create it. Rainwater doesn't replenish it. So as we exhaust it, which we're doing, we're taking away one of the single biggest supplies of fresh water in that region in the United States. In Baton Rouge, Louisiana, if you go into any restaurant that sells shellfish, there's a sign on the wall that warns you that eating that shellfish may be hazardous to your health. If you go to San Francisco Bay and you sit on a dock, there'll be a sign on a piling at the pier warning you that if you take a fish out of San Francisco Bay and eat it, it may be hazardous to your health. There's a standing rule for every river and stream in the state of New York 
that if you eat more than one meal of fish per week, it could be hazardous to your health. The damage has gone so far that the very food that we could rely on on those waterways is really too hazardous for us to eat. The foundation of civilization, which is our rivers and waterways, is starting to crumble. And the society that's built on top of it is declining along with it. Pollution uh, is on the rise. We are over consuming water. We are not at the doorstep of a crisis. We are in a crisis. Uh, and if we don't take action immediately, uh, the crisis will reach a point where we cannot recover from it. We can save millions of lives had we a sensor technology to let us know as an early warning system what's in water. What you're saying is giving to the kernel of one of my pet peeves, that just because we can measure stuff, we can control exactly. everything. Stories of the world's great empires all share one reoccurring theme, water. Wars have been fought over it, and losing it has meant the death of entire civilizations. Today, John Cronin believes water is in more demand and in shorter supply than ever before. Water is as much a part of our history as wars and, and revolutions and art and music. But because we take it for granted, we don't see it as the foundation of society. If that foundation continues to crumble, the society on top of it is going to crumble along with it. This is not a new phenomenon. In fact, it's as old as civilization itself. In Mesopotamia, 6,000 years ago, where Iraq is today, the Sumerians invented irrigation using water from the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And just as we are careless with our use of water now, the Sumerians were careless then. In an attempt to feed their increasing population, they over-irrigated. The farmers wanted to reduce irrigation, but their leaders refused because food was a source of power. The consequence for the Sumerians was the death of their civilization. The stakes are just as high for us today. Imagine anything of consequence to the daily operation of the nation as a whole. If the White House ran out of water, everybody would have to leave the White House. If the offices of Congress ran out of water, everybody would have to leave Congress. The lights go out, you can sit at your desk. You run out of water, you pretty much have to leave. There's nothing for you to do. You can't use toilets, you have nothing to drink. When we talk about the idea of actually water stopping, you have to think about how it happens. One way is that we start running out of water, and it all starts getting rationed. Now, rationing can mean a lot of things. It can mean that if you like to be clean every day, maybe you're not gonna be clean every day. In Australia, you're not allowed to take a shower for more than five minutes. That's it. It's against the law. It can mean the water you used to take out of your tap now has to be boiled every time you use it because we've had to resort to supplies of lesser quality. When you start reaching the point where your supply has declined so much that your everyday life gets rationed, that's a downward spiral because our population's increasing. If you go now to other parts of the world, you go to Singapore. Singapore is the canary in the mine for the rest of the world. Singapore's entire future now is based on recycling its sewage waste into drinking water. And you know who else is thinking about this right now? Australia, California, Arizona are thinking about the dramatic cultural change it's going to require to get their citizens to accept the idea that we may have to start recycling sewage waste for drinking water. In 2007, the U.S. Geological Survey projected that at least 36 states would face water shortages within five years. That means some of these states are already facing challenges. Cronin, however, is worried not just about the quantity of the water, but the quality. 19 and a half million residents of the United States get sick from bacteria, 
uh, viruses and parasites every year. It comes from pollution of drinking water with human wastes. This is frightening in the 21st century because it's one of the oldest problems civilization deals with, keeping human waste separate from the water that we drink. Had a flu caused those kind of consequences, uh, every medical expert and authority in, in the country would be, called, would be put on alert because of it. And if we do not stop that, that pollution, uh, we are facing uh, rates of illnesses that are going to increase and the equivalent of a pandemic. The waste dumped by sewage treatment plants into our oceans and rivers not only can contaminate drinking water with bacteria and viruses, but also with chemicals from the beverages we drink and the medicines we take. One of the most alarming discoveries about pollution in the last decade is that there are things that we use every day that sewage treatment plants do not remove that are starting to show up in the waters of the United States. So we're starting to find caffeine in fish. The coffee flows through us. It goes down our toilets. It goes to the sewage treatment plant, which is not equipped to remove caffeine. The caffeine flows out the sewage treatment plant into the nearby river. The caffeine goes into the fish. Maybe caffeine doesn't turn out to be a problem, but maybe other things do. Those plants were not designed to remove exotic chemicals. Pharmaceuticals, uh, prescription drugs that we take, or take a flu or some sort of virus it starts transporting itself throughout water supplies in the United States. And we wake, wake up one day with, literally with an epidemic. Cronin makes a strong case for fresh water being the foundation of our society. He feels we need technological innovation allowing us to measure precisely what is in our water at any given moment. So we start meeting needs, and I'll give you an example. I can go on any cell phone, and I can tell you the UV index and relative humidity in almost real time of any location on the planet. There is nobody who can tell you in real time what's in the glass of water you're drinking. We can save millions of lives had we a sensor technology to let us know as an early warning system what's in water you know what how, how do you even get how do you even create heart. that world what you're saying is getting to the kernel of one of my pet peeves that just because we can measure stuff we can control everything exactly. It's incredibly grandiose and foolish. What I'm seeing in our culture these days is what I call uh, a disease of too much magic. And uh, I think it's perhaps a very fortunate thing that the human race is facing what I would call maybe a reset of its activity, not necessarily a collapse, but let's call it a reset. James Howard Kunstler, born 1948 in New York City, an investigative journalist and author, especially since the 1970s, has been the oil industry. Kunstler has lived through an oil embargo enforced by foreign suppliers. Now, he has convinced the planet will soon impose a greater one that will likely lead to the collapse of society as we know it. And when I was a young reporter, starting out in the early 70s, I covered the OPEC oil embargo of 1973, and, and it made a huge impression on me. You started to see lines form at the gas stations. People were unable to get to work. You know, I have this vivid memory of uh, somehow I managed to get a full tank of gas, and I wanted to drive down to New York City to see a girl. And I drove down the New York State Thruway, and I was the only car in the Thruway for about 150 miles. And it was like the day the Earth stood still. It made a big impression on me to see how fragile the everyday world that we'd gotten accustomed to really was. That was 40 years ago. I think that the energy crunch of the 21st century is going to be much different, much harsher, have permanent repercussions that are gonna thunder through the lives of generations to come. We are heading into uncharted territory of civilization. I think the people of the United States, a uh, generation from now, are going to be astounded at how we squandered the wealth of the 20th century. 
I think the people of the future are going to look back on us in wonder and nausea at what we've done. They're going to be left uh, holding the bag, and it's going to be a very empty bag. History is a graveyard of fallen empires, and today there are those who say America is in danger of suffering the same fate. Among them, James Kunstler is convinced diminishing oil supplies will play a critical role in our downfall. Peak oil is the moment in history when uh, an individual oil field or a region or a nation produces the most oil it ever will. The U.S. had its moment of peak oil in 1970. That was 40 years ago when we produced 10 million barrels a day. And we're down to 5 million barrels a day now. The problem is when the world hits peak oil, and that's where we're at now, we're on that, that bumpy slope down that, that's going to get rougher and rougher. The oil story really starts around 1860. In the USA, we are the first nation that uh, ramps up multi-layered, comprehensive oil industry. And it's been normal for many generations of Americans now, so it's hard for us to imagine us not having oil. But in fact, peak oil happened in America in 1970. years ago, America produced the most oil that, will, that it will ever produce in a given year, which was around 10 million barrels a day. And ever since then, it's been going down. America made up for its problem of, of peak oil and uh, of entering the arc of depletion by importing oil from other countries. The problem for the world is that once the world passes their production peak, we're not going to be able to import oil from other solar systems. The assumption is, is that the downslope is a gentle downslope, that, it, you know, that it's, we're just sort of gliding into depletion. But I think that that really misrepresents the reality of the situation. The real story is going to be how the major complex systems of daily life begin to destabilize and mutually reinforce each other's instabilities and failures as we get into trouble with this peak oil problem. We consume 20 million barrels of oil each day in the United States, most of which is imported. And every day, our demand for oil increases. Oil, however, is a finite resource the U.S. government is aware of the problem. The U.S. Department of Energy hired a scientific consulting firm run by a guy named Robert Hirsch. The Hirsch report was published in 2005. Hirsch reported that we were indeed facing uh, a peak oil predicament that was going to rock our world, uh, that was going to change all the terms of everyday life in advanced societies and deprive us of many of the comforts conveniences, amenities, and necessities that we had come to take for granted. The Hirsch report was buried by the Department of Energy because they saw no way that the American public could deal with the idea that this way of life might be threatened. The Hirsch report was really rather bad news. It was telling the USA that, that we were facing a, an imminent crisis. America didn't want to hear it. It was too painful. The Hirsch Report projects that oil production worldwide will peak either in this decade or almost certainly by 2030. The report also states that the economic, social, and political costs will be unprecedented. The peak oil story is not really about running out of oil. It's about what happens to all these complex systems that we depend on for everyday life. The way we produce our food, that's one system. And that mainly means industrial agriculture. 
where you're applying a lot of oil and gas byproducts to huge factory farms and producing cheese doodles and chicken, Pepsi-Cola or hogs or whatever it is. That's how we do farming. That's how we feed ourselves in America. That's going to be coming to an end, and probably fairly shortly. And it'll be a huge problem. Uh, you can't imagine anything more destabilizing to a, a culture than people going hungry. The way we make things, buy things, sell things, move them around, that's all going to change. There's been really one model for the last 30 years or so, and that's national chain retail, giant corporations moving massive amounts of stuff. The semi-trucks that are incessantly circulating around the interstate highways, they pick the stuff up in San Pedro, California, and they schlep it across the nation to Philadelphia. And that's how we do commerce in America. It's normal for people. You know, they love the Walmart. It's become, you know, enshrined as an institution now, like, uh, you know, apple pie and motherhood. There's a lot of fantasizing that's going on right now. A lot of wishing that's going on in America right now, that we're going to run this stuff by other means, that we're going to run all the cars, and that we're going to run Walt Disney World and the interstate highway system and Walmart and the U.S. Army and suburbia on something other than oil. It's not going to happen. We're going to be very disappointed about that. We will develop alternatives to fossil fuels, but many experts believe we may never develop replacements. Oil is simply more potent and costs less to produce than any other energy source, at least for the foreseeable future. We are not the first society in history to face the depletion of its most precious resource. We just have to hope we are the first to overcome it. You know, there's that old aphorism that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And, you know, we see kind of similar things happening in a different way. Uh, other cultures have gotten into trouble with their resources and with their political response to their own resource problems. We're like ancient Rome, only with baseball and pizza. Look at what happened to Easter Island. They were a Polynesian culture on a remote island in the Pacific. If you go there now, what you'll find is a treeless island populated with giant stone heads left behind by the Easter Islanders. But the island wasn't always barren. It used to be covered in trees, and the trees were to the Easter Islanders what oil is to us today, their primary resource. They used it for all the important daily needs of life, and their population grew to, we estimate, about maybe 20,000 people at the height of this culture. And before you know it, there's not a whole lot of wood left. And their population starts to crash, and they get pretty desperate. There's a lot of evidence that they actually started getting into cannibalism in the final florid phase of this collapse. They start building all these immense stone monuments. You know, they may have been an attempt to appease the gods to allow them to get some kind of resource back. You know, I think you can state categorically that as a society becomes more uh, fearful and desperate and economically stressed, that the delusional thinking increases. I think it's a kind of thing that the human brain does in, in a state of desperation. A world without fossil fuels would be a dark, difficult place. There are some who believe that we may still be able to find solutions if we act quickly. Many, like Kunstler, know that the consequences for not finding alternatives will have repercussions for generations to come. I think the people of the future are going to look back on us in wonder and nausea at what we've done. They're going to be inhabiting a planet whose resources have been largely depleted, and we're going to be back to living off the true solar energy of the planet, you know, the stuff that comes in from the sunshine every day, they're going to be left holding the bag. And it's going to be a very empty bag. I think the future is going to be difficult for America. I think it's going to be a surprisingly austere place, struggling to stay warm in the winter, struggling to feed themselves, or have uh, any kind of a really a gainful occupation. 
living among the detritus and the salvage of the industrial age and trying to make something of the pieces that are left. America is going to have to contract and probably uh, to some extent retreat back into our corner of the world, the Western Hemisphere, with lower expectations for being able to influence and moderate the behavior of other people in the world and uh, a reduced ability to control the great issues uh, of, uh, of world economy and, and global politics. We're so psychologically in invested in all of the mythology of uh, you know, what we became in the 20th century, you know, this, this, the greatest power that the world has ever seen and the greatest economy that the world has ever seen. And, and it was quite a trip and it was a lot of fun and it was exciting and comfortable and convenient, sometimes joyous and thrilling. And now we're done with that, it's over. James Kunstler is convinced nothing can prevent peak oil. But he and others are equally certain that the havoc it creates will be lessened if we can make changes now. For me, the most important thing is, is to stimulate and liberate local food production, to do anything possible to help people grow food where they live. But how do you grow your own local food if you're living in a high-rise apartment? It's happening all over the world right now. There are rooftop gardens, there are window box gardens, vacant lots in major metropolitan areas are, 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 are being converted to community-supported agriculture. Enough to live on? Enough to feed more people than will be fed otherwise. I offer no magic bullets that will allow everybody to live the way we have been living. I started as a cop. My job is to save as many lives as possible. This is a triage emergency situation. When I listen to you, in a sense, you're all human scale problems. For example, water shortage, economic collapse, oil shortage. But the problems I'm concerned with, in a sense, are almost post-human. I see this century that the technologies will allow massively intelligent machines. They, they could actually contribute to some of these solutions. But it's a two-edged sword, yeah. right? These machines that humanity could build would be so complicated that, that we could not understand them. And therefore, we could not predict how they might behave towards us. Maybe they, they would become very unfriendly to us. They estimate that it's going to occur in the 2040s. And most people watching this program today will be alive when this happens. They may decide that human beings are so inferior to them, they may wipe us out like a mosquito. Some of the greatest threats to the future of America are economic collapse, water shortage and contamination, and oil depletion. Each is an evil we know, but there is one looming danger that may overshadow them all. One with the potential to wipe mankind off the face of the earth. Professor Hugo de Garris, born 1947 in Sydney, Australia, designs artificial intelligences his research is leading the way toward the evolution of self-aware robots. He sees a future in which artificial intelligences are far more powerful than the entire human race combined. It's only a question of time now before humanity can build artificial brains that are far more intelligent than human beings. So this is a huge issue which I believe will eclipse any other human issue this century. I call this species dominance. People have been saying for a long time, well, look, <laughs> robots are just around the corners, but that, that corner's been around for 50 odd years, so you know, when's it going to happen? Arthur the Robot, the second mechanical man built by the Oakland, California high school youth, Arthur represents all of a month's after school tinkering. Most people have probably heard of something called Moore's Law. He said in the 60s that the number of transistors on a chip doubles every year and a half or so. So it's largely because of that phenomenon, that trend, that it's more or less now that there's enough capacity in, in electronics to, to actually make these artificial brains. The Korean, South Korean government, they will aim to put a home robot, a useful, intelligent home robot, in every Korean household by 2020. 
And Bill Gates is on record as saying by 2030, the home robot industry will be one of the biggest and richest in the world. And why is that? Well, I mean, imagine you, you really had a machine that could do all the household tasks. It would be so useful that you would be prepared to spend big money on it. The rapid acceleration of technological innovation in recent years may soon enable us to create robots that look and behave like humans. So imagine in the 2020s, you get a phone call from your neighbor and your neighbor tells you, hey, come over, come and look at my new home robot. So you knock on the door of your neighbor and his home robot answers and cracks a joke. And, and you're amazed, my God, the vocabulary of this thing is about double, triple what, what my home robot has. And, it, and it's even cynical, it has a sense of humor. My God, wow, you know, impressive. So two weeks later, you rush off and, and buy yourself the next model, right? I mean, the same way today we do with our iPods and iPads and, and, and so on. So imagine you do this several times, each upgrade that you do, your home robot's getting smarter and smarter. The human IQ level, let's say it's here, and the robot IQ level, let's say it's here, but you can, it's, it, it then becomes clear to everybody that there's a trend, right? That gap, that difference between human IQ and robot IQ, that gap is lessening. It's getting smaller and smaller as the years pass, right? So it will become obvious to everybody that it's only a question of time before the home robot intelligence level catches up to human level. Scientists have long predicted what they call the singularity. This theory states that artificial intelligence will eventually develop self-awareness and begin to think and act independently of human control. DeGarris believes that when the singularity arrives, mankind will for the first time face competition as the planet's dominant species. This whole idea of species dominance, it sounds like science fiction to most people because today's machines are not intelligent. But as a professional brain builder myself, and I know there are thousands of guys working on this, this problem now, how to make artificial intelligence. The, the, the progress level in neuroscience, the supercomputers that, are, that today have an equal bit processing rate as the human brain, all these factors, you put them together, and it makes the idea of species dominance very real. I mean, make the analogy in the 30s, you had the nuclear physicists saying a bomb was coming, and everybody ridiculed them because it sounded ridiculous. One bomb, one city, that's nuts. Okay? But it happened within a mere 12 years or so from the first prediction. People will start asking all kinds of obvious questions like, well, are these machines going to become as intelligent as human beings? Should we try to stop it? Could we stop it? If Bill Gates is right, saying that by 2030, the home robot industry will be worth literally trillions of dollars a year, Right? So enormous uh, economic momentum. Now, how do you stop that? And then you've got the military momentum, because in the time frame we're talking about, you know, the 2030s, probably what's the dominant uh, political reality of those times? Well, I suggest it will probably be the global rivalry between the US and China. Imagine you're the Minister of Defense you will not have the luxury to allow the other guy to develop systems that create more intelligent soldier robots and, and military systems than the other country. Even if the public gets really alarmed, the national security type arguments will ensure this development will go on. The benefits and conveniences offered by highly intelligent robots are undeniable. And it is easy to imagine how quickly we will become accustomed to their presence. But the pace of their evolution will be so rapid that Daguerre's wonders just how long before the servant becomes the master. So our artificial brains will become more and more like our brains, like, like natural biological brains. And you, you need to remember, these artificial brains, they're thinking a million times faster than we are. Whereas our brains, our biological brains, they're operating at chemical speeds. Electronic brains think at the speed of light. So can you imagine if one of these brains had human level intelligence? It could do a PhD in minutes, which is pretty scary. 
So effectively, there's no limit to, to, to their capacities. They, they could be, well, not only thinking uh, much faster, but virtually unlimited memory, right? So you could, you could put all the world's knowledge into one artificial brain. They could do evolutionary type experiments on parts of themselves and then look at the results. And if the results were good, they could then incorporate those new results into themselves and restructure themselves and all at the speed of light. So they, they would be almost godlike, these creatures. I give them a name. I call them artilect. That's short for artificial intellect, because that's what they'd be. They'd be artificial minds. The potential of these machines is so vastly greater than what we are as humans, it's possible that in a highly advanced form, they may decide, for whatever reason, maybe for reasons we don't even understand as humans, they may decide that human beings are so inferior to them, they may treat us as a pest. Imagine a mosquito lands on my arm, and I'm human, right, and that's a mosquito, and I go, but I'm human, I don't give a damn. So we would have no idea what their attitudes towards us as a species would be. They may decide to get rid of all the oxygen because it rusts their circuitry or something, right? And not care about the consequences of that decision, their, their action, towards us. Oops, an accident. Bad aim or something. But was it an accident? Arthur ain't talking. Seems suspicious, though, when the controls are just about foolproof. But Arthur and the robot's a harmless fellow, and uh-oh, here he comes. This is where we go. Worrying about hostile robots may seem premature, especially when compared to the immediate threats of peak oil and water shortage. But even these crises may, in time, seem minor relative to the realities of a world dominated by artificial super beings. Something that really, really scared me was the notion that with the enhancement of AI, that human beings could become God. And quite frankly, that scares me to death. The resource and money problems that we face are so severe that I, I think that they're gonna put this kind of activity out of business before it really ramps up. But here, here's, the, here's the thing though, no matter what any one of us talk about, it's gonna survive if there's a marketplace for it. And the marketplace is defined by the people who are out the there. The marketplace that you're talking about is a collective agreement between people about what reality consists of. And that reality is changing very swiftly. Hugo, I'm especially fascinated with your work that from what you described about how machines are gonna be trillions of times smarter than we are, and they're gonna be able to solve all these great problems. It sounds like all the problems the rest of us are concerned about, the machines are gonna fix them all. Uh, in my own case, I'm very concerned that you know we're gonna wake up tomorrow and, you know, uh, six or eight major American cities are going to be nuked off the face of the earth. And there's absolutely no reason why this couldn't happen. The, it, that sudden apocalypse. Luis Alvarez, who designed the triggering mechanisms for the Hiroshima bombs, he said what people don't understand is the hardest thing isn't to make bombs go off, it's to keep them from going off. Most experts say that nuclear terror strikes are going to happen. The nuclear bomb fuel's been available too long. So as long as the nuclear bomb fuel's there, somebody is going to steal some, they're going to cobble one or more nukes together, and they're going to set them off. Unfortunately, it's just a matter of time. I think one of the problems facing the United States today is people either feel too secure in the United States, too secure in their futures, or they just don't care. They're apathetic. I think it's terribly important to get this information out there. And I hate to say it, but to wake people up. America we know today could look very different tomorrow as converging forces threaten not only our prosperity, but ultimately our very survival. Most believe the crisis will unfold gradually, but some believe it could happen overnight.
The greatest threat to America today is nuclear terrorists. It's far too easy for them to steal the nuclear bomb fuel, to cobble crude nuclear devices together, and to set them off in major American cities. Robert Gleason, born 1945, Michigan City, Indiana, is the executive editor of Tor Forge Books. There he has published the writing of former members of the Pentagon, CIA, NSA, and FBI. What these men have told him has alerted him to a devastating threat. I think one of the problems facing the United States today is people either feel too secure in the United States, too secure in their futures, or they just don't care, they're apathetic. I think it's terribly important to get this information out there. And I hate to say it, but to wake people up, to let them know that uh, America's exalted position in the world could end in a heartbeat overnight. Nuclear weapons, particularly thermonuclear weapons, are man-made suns detonated on the Earth. It is a small, a miniature star, uh, except in this case, whereas our sun gives us life, this man-made star brings death. One of the things about terrorist nukes is that they're surprisingly easy to, to construct to set off if you have the nuclear bomb fuel. If you get the equipment from an old winery or an old dairy, in six months you can manufacture your own nuclear reprocessor. Within one month you will have reprocessed enough nuclear waste that you will have bomb-grade plutonium, and you can set off the Nagasaki bomb with it. Another way to do it is just to go into one of these nuclear storage sites and steal the actual bomb fuel itself. As we know, it's shockingly easy to do it even in the United States. At Los Alamos, there was a study done in which they disguised some former Special Forces guys, and they wanted to see if they could steal some bomb fuel. The mock terrorists came in with a Home Depot garden cart and trundled out enough nuclear bomb fuel to build a bomb. That is in the United States of America. If we can't secure our own nuclear bomb fuel, how is Pakistan going to do it? How is India going to do it? How is Russia going to do it? Countries that are just rife with all kinds of bribery. Michael Shore, who at the CIA ran the bin Laden uh, unit for years, said bin Laden has always been obsessed with obtaining nuclear weapons. Al-Qaeda's been obsessed with it. We do know that there's been some years where the Russians have caught 500 people in, in a single year trying to steal nuclear materials out, out of Russia. What percentage of that is the total? Is, is there 5,000? Is there 50,000? All we know is that the people that got caught how about the people that didn't get caught? While military-grade nuclear weapons are unavailable to terrorist groups, security analysts believe a crude but still powerful bomb is within their ability to build and detonate. It could happen any day. Say it's Wednesday, 9 a.m., one of our big cities. A van pulls into a car park in a crowded neighborhood. Inside that van are the terrorists. They have the simplest improvised nuclear device you can build, a 10 kiloton gun-type bomb, the same size as the Hiroshima bomb. Depending on how complex they've made it, they can get away with having acquired as little as 26 pounds of highly enriched uranium. An amount like that is not out of the question. The blast zone for a bomb that size is about a square mile. Just think a minute about what might be in that radius. For one thing, you have public schools. Bus terminals and train stations, literally packed with commuters. Museums with collections of the most famous art in the entire world. And of course, tourists are everywhere on the streets. You have office buildings, theaters, hotels, public libraries, restaurants, people's homes. Depending on where you are, there could be a million people in the area, an area that is about to become ground zero. In a few minutes, all of them, everything that was in the square mile will be gone.
we face a cruel irony of history. The risk of a nuclear confrontation between nations has gone down, but the risk of nuclear attack has gone up. Just the smallest amount of plutonium, about the size of an apple, could kill and injure hundreds of thousands of innocent people. Terrorist networks, such as Al-Qaeda, have tried to acquire the material for a nuclear weapon, and if they ever succeeded, they would surely use it. Were they to do so, it would be a catastrophe for the world. The immediate blast damage from a nuclear attack would be catastrophic, but the long-term repercussions would be far worse. The landscape of America would be changed forever. The implications are so severe, most choose not even to consider them. I've talked to a number of military analysts that worked at the Pentagon and at the War College. They claim the Pentagon really doesn't study the subject of nuclear terrorism. They couldn't find any studies, classified or unclassified, that the Pentagon's ever done. I think it's because nu nuclear terrorism nullifies everything we know about military strategy and tactics. It is the reductio ad absurdum of, of warfare. Since 9-11, the threat of terrorism has become a daily fact of life for every American. Most perceive it as a problem beyond their power to control. But that may prove small comfort to our children and the generations to come. Bomb strikes, and if a terrorist took out eight cities in one day, you have all the great apocalypses rolled up into one. You talk about water shortages, there is no water. You talk about energy shortages, there is no energy. It's the elephant in the living room. We refuse to address it, we refuse to talk about it. I think future generations will look back on our apathy and inaction and be horrified. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Unfortunately, if I get blown up in a nuclear attack, there's not much I can do about it. What I like to do as an American is take action with my own hands. What about our practical problems of the future? Well, you know, it's nice to say that water is the pressing problem, oil is, money is. The, the problem is they're all going to come together at once. And whichever wins the horse race and gets there first, you know, who knows? Maybe it'll be nuclear ter terrorism, maybe we run out of water, maybe there's a financial collapse. But I don't think there's ever been a time in American history where we saw so many apocalyptic problems on our, on our time horizon in the near future. With problems of such immense scope and consequence, the question is whether these men can come to any sort of consensus about which of these problems will befall us first. There are a number of real big game changers out there, and they seem to be converging. These are amazing problems that are going to come back and bite us very hard, and they're going to bite us all at the same time like a pack of wolves. America stands at a crossroads, unprecedented in over 200 years as a nation. These men have described their versions of the future, each one terrifying and each one seemingly possible. Now they must decide which is the gravest threat to the United States and what can we do to prevent it. We've covered a lot of ground. We've talked about a lot of different things. It would be interesting if we could each talk about what we consider to be the most immediate pressing problems, and also, you know, perhaps what could be done about them. And who knows, maybe at the end of it, we might reach some kind of a consensus. You go. What would you? So if you ask me which particular problem is the most pressing, I, I, I guess it'd be Jones. It's water. Because <laughs> it's primary, right? It's basic. So if we can't solve that problem immediately, then go on, all the rest, the rest just collapses. I mean, imagine it. You, you turn on the faucet and nothing comes out. I was thinking, my God, if, if no water comes out of the faucet, I can't survive six months or six years. I can't survive six hours. You know, one of the fir first casualties of running out of water is uh, there's no water for sanitation. Disease starts to spread. You start getting plagues that, you know, we thought we'd eliminated a long time ago. 
The world is running out of water very rapidly. And the population's proliferating, the consumption's proliferating, and the, the water sources are shrinking. I don't, really don't know what the answer to that problem is. Fact is, we live in a water economy. Uh, we, we, more than we live in a petroleum economy. Uh, water runs the world. But its misuse is also the source of a downward cycle of poverty, uh, disease, and human suffering and political instability. That's all here right now. There is no one thing to do. There is no magic bullet that solves our water problems uh, for a number of reasons. One is water problems are profoundly local. We have to look at what comes out of our tap as being more precious than oil, being more precious than a gold standard, being more precious than our currency, being something that we have to immediately protect. Like right now, right this second, uh, and not just be worrying about uh, a nuclear holocaust that's maybe a year or two years or 10 years down the road. This is an everyday threat. We've kind of forgotten about water. We're under the impression that our, our laws have taken care of all that. Uh, they have not. The public doesn't know the size of that failure. That awareness will result in an expectation and a demand. The, the American public will respond if they have the knowledge. John Cronin's message is clear. Protect the nation's water supply today or suffer dire consequences tomorrow. But not everyone agrees this is the most pressing concern. I think we're facing multiple crises. I still believe that uh, they will manifest first in the financial and currency system, and that does have implications depending on how governments respond for international trade and availability of resources and our supply chain. And there are some core assumptions of our economic system that have to be re-examined. And uh, I think that's happening now. I think 2008, Lehman Brothers, we came this close to a total unraveling. And people at the highest levels are thinking about how to avoid that in the future and how to redesign our financial system and maybe our economic system so that doesn't happen again. In order to get to Hugo's problem of uh, artificial intelligent Terminator guys 50 years from now, we need to make it through the next 10 years. I think the biophysical crises of energy and water and other things like that are going to first manifest in social crises. Michael, what, what do you see as the most pressing concrete problems? One in seven Americans now is below the poverty line. One in eight families is on food stamps. Those numbers are increasing. 30, 40 million unemployed depending upon who is counting the statistics, the people are hurting, and they're hurting as a result of an economic collapse, which is exacerbated and compounded by resource shortages, peak oil, energy, fresh water, everything else. I see signs of a shift in human consciousness. I see signs, very clear signs, of, of a global awakening. Many, many millions of people understanding this. The, move to, the moves to relocalize food production, to start growing food where people live, to, to relocalize your support groups close to where you live is really a worldwide movement. Well, I'm not persuaded that uh, most of the major problems can be ranked in the order of importance. I think that they're all going to redound on each other. My central animating idea is that there are several competing fiascos that threaten to put us out of business as an advanced industrial civilization. While there seems to be some consensus that our debt-based society and the world's water issues are the greatest problems we face, there is less agreement on what can be done to stave off a potential collapse. There are a number of real big game changers out there, and they seem to be converging. The energy uh, narrative is pretty clear. The banking problems we have right now, uh, the shortage of capital, the uh, failures of governance and the rule of law in our financial system, you know, th th these are amazing problems that are going to come back and bite us very hard. And they're gonna bite us all at the same time like a pack of wolves. And there are three things that I would recommend that we can do. The first thing is that we can reestablish the rule of law in our banking and financial practice. Second thing I would propose is we need to direct our dwindling resources into the task of rebuilding local economies. The third thing that I think we need to do is 
rebuild the conventional railroad system in the United States, and we should uh, do that right away. And if we don't do it, I'm not sure that there will be anything that will physically allow the United States to hang together as a culture, a people, and a nation. We've mentioned the collapse of an advanced industrial civilization several times, and my gut and my research of historical civilization suggests that our population will in the end be more resilient than, than some people give, give credit to. The average person needs to start thinking about a future where instead of more every year, there might be the, the same every year or less every year. I agree that we need to um, relocalize our food systems. We also need to relocalize the production of a lot of basic needs. In effect, we need to insource where we have been uh, outsourcing because of efficiency and profits around the world. I think Buy American really makes sense because the things that we need to make and that we need for our, our lives should be made locally. I think a consensus is emerging that relocalization is a solution to many problems in terms of food production, resource usage, and anything else. Also in terms of uh, uh, starting a local currency, anything you can do to be sustainable close to where you live, there's no universal solution but I'm seeing a, an agreement on that. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, I would agree with you, Mike, uh, and, and, but I would also add that, uh, you know, in the spirit of going with the flow of history and circumstance, that this is where we have to go anyway. And, and that, uh, you yes. know, society's being self-organizing and emergent. Th that's our destination anyway, even if we have to be dragged kicking and screaming to it. Yes. It seems to me the, um, again, it's, it's really tempting to say that all of these things are interrelated. History teaches us only one thing, the way things are today are not the way they're going to be tomorrow. All I'm convinced of is we have very little time to do anything. And, uh, and, and perhaps time may be a resource we have not addressed in this whole discussion today is how much time we have to deal or address these issues and what we can do in that time. What we're finding out is that the way we're going to have to live is the way we should have been living all along anyway. I think it's going to be much more rewarding. I, I, I don't see it as all suffering by any means. Life moves so quickly it's hard for us to stop and consider where it's going. There are, however, times in our history when we simply have no choice. These men are certain that moment is now. But even though they have spoken, there remains one question that must be answered. Will we listen? We've talked about a lot of extremely uh, catastrophic problems. They are all really horrific problems. My sense of what the problems are hasn't changed at all. My sense of the dire emergency and the temporal urgency of addressing them has increased. Pretty clearly, we're not psychologically prepared for the changes that we face. We can't afford to be crybabies anymore. We can't afford to sit around wringing our hands. We have a very big to-do list. We face an array of problems. They're all equally severe. The assumption that if we get one thing right or one part of this right that we're just going to keep on going ahead being a hyper complex society, you know, I think is erroneous. Personally, I don't think that this is the end of the world or the end of the human race, you know. I think it's the end of a certain phase of history. I think we need a time out from technology. We're all obviously worried about the water shortage. Three of us seem to think that was really pressing, urgent, and scary. The, the other three also saw something else in the problems. When the, everything really goes down, one of the things you're going to be looking at is a global economic collapse, and money itself becomes a problem. I think the American financial system is completely unsustainable at, at these levels. We should all strive to be less wasteful, but our economic system is kind of based on waste. In terms of solutions, I think one solution that we all agreed on, we thought was paramount, was relocalization, decentralization. We pointed out that the average meal comes from 1,400 miles away. What you're looking at, if, if, if society breaks down, you're looking at mass famine. We are hopelessly too dependent on power grids, telecommunication grids, which are uh, in times of societal breakdown, we could well lose. What we're finding out is that the way we're going to have to live is the way we should have been living all along anyway. And in a way that's probably much more fulfilling 
from an emotional, a spiritual, and psychological, and the standpoint of human interaction. I think it's going to be much more rewarding. I, I, I don't see it as all suffering by any means. We have to be more self-sufficient. We can't rely on stuff to protect us that's thousands of miles away. In times of really great oppression, you, you need to band together. You need to help each other. You need to sacrifice for your friends because at a certain point, they're going to have to sacrifice for you. If we could somehow learn to work together and we could come to see humanity as, as one community, probably nothing is impossible then. But as long as, you know, it's, it's us against them, uh, the in-group and the out-group, that kind of thinking uh, is the road to perdition. In many respects, I felt I met my match, right? These, these guys were smart, really on top of their field and, and amongst the best in the world in what they do. Part of the shock effect of, of, of uh, you know, this meeting, this, this circle of six guys, was the, the, this big question mark that arose. I, I have it burned into my brain now, this, this, this question of what if the lights go out? I will tell you one more solution that I think is really great. It's we're talking about these things. If nobody talks about these things, nothing happens. And quite frankly, the kind of public discourse I've heard is a deafening silence. We are the one species on the planet that will run into a burning fire to save a complete stranger. We're the one species on the planet that will organize our community to help a community on the other side of the world that we may never visit. We're the one species on the planet that has the compassion to make sacrifices to help another species. And that's why what Martin Luther King said is so important. You know, the arc of the universe is long, but it tends towards justice. Humans are a compassionate, caring species, and ultimately, I believe we end up taking care of each other. These men have reached an uneasy consensus. Most feel a water crisis and economic instability are imminent threats to America. All agree peak oil and overpopulation also represent serious problems. Nuclear terrorism remains a possibility too terrible to consider, and the issues posed by the development of artificial intelligence seem relatively distant. It has been said that a generation which ignores history has no past and no future. Now, it is up to us to decide, will we sit by and watch as they watched in Rome, as they watched in Mesopotamia, as they watched time and time again, as everything we have built, all we have achieved, disappears into the mist of history. 2,500 years ago, Aeschylus said in the Agamemnon, looking back on the Trojan War, which was a stupid, foolish undertaking, done largely out of pride, and he doubted that the human race was really capable of rational solutions to serious problems. In terms of how humanity learns and how they grow, Eskola said, we learn nothing save through